10 seconds. <clears throat> and you're live. Okay, um, how's everybody doing today? My name is Dave Kokenauer. I run uh, pretty much IT operations for a small base in Iraq. And today we'll be talking about HajiNets, how most of the guys over there have been getting just straight vanilla civilian internet access in the middle of a country that has absolutely no infrastructure. Okay, that's a picture of my office. I managed to get a uh, Power Mac G5 smuggled in through eBay. <laughs> um, okay, what is it? It's a troop run ISP basically. What, what we'll do is we go out and uh, buy just a standard satellite dish and then split the costs among you know, anywhere from 25 to right now our site's running at about 350 subscribers. And there are a couple reasons why we do it. The, uh, you know, Department of Defense gives us an MWR cafe. For every thousand troops, you get something like six to 12 computers. I mean, that's great, except some of the more gray list sites are kind of blocked. They don't, like, basically, you can't get porn off of it, <laughs> among other things. But they're, they're just kind of regulated. You can't have it in your room. You know, there's lines and time limits that go along with it. And um, the other problem you'll get into is that if there are 30 guys waiting for get on, to get on a computer, you can't really talk to the folks back home for anything longer than 10, 15 minutes because then they kick you off and try to cycle the next guy through. So we just decided to do it ourselves. And since we pay for it, there's no real oversight to it. OK. A um, couple different types of networks I've seen out there are you'll have the smaller, like small office, home office dishes that basically a platoon of guys will get together, 25 to 50 guys. And they'll split it up. Bandwidth costs about 1500 bucks a month, which is pretty expensive. And it's about four and a half grand for the hardware. But if you split it up about 25 guys, it's not too bad. Um, speed's not great, but you know, what do you expect really? Then you get up into larger ones that guys will buy out business grade systems for like right now we're spending 15,500 a month for a six megabits on the down, one megabit on the up. Faster than it sounds on paper, but still pretty expensive. That's why, that's why you need a lot of people to get a dish like that. Everything's basically uh, civilian off the shelf equipment. Here's where I'm stationed at. You've got right here, you have uh, Fallujah. Out towards the west, you have Ramadi. And we're right in the middle. It's actually an old Royal Air Force base that's been abandoned for about 30 years. So it's pretty fun to live there. Uh, abandoned buildings, kind of like every B movie, end of the world scenario you've seen. That's what the place is like. It's great. Um, if you're ever running, the, the best part about it is I can run Cat 5 however I want. If I want to like knock out a building to get a wire through, like if I want to just kick, some, kick a hole through a wall, they don't care. So it's got its advantages. Um, everything is run off of just like grid power where there's no, it's not like we can go out to the local like Duquesne Light or any civilian market. So we just have generators on the post. There's no telephone lines. There's no fiber optic lines. There's, I think they're working on it, but as of right now, it's basically everything's done satellite. We pretty much roll our own when it comes to everything. OK. On our network, the one that I run is uh, PantherNet. We have 350 subscribers for uh, 6 megabits on the down, 1 meg on the up. And most of the time, we've got anywhere from 170 to 200 people online. And uh, it's close to an ISDN line. Like, it's never been as slow as dial-up is. But of course, like a uh, regular cable modem back in the States is going to smoke it. Uh, charge the guys 60 bucks a month, and there's a $100 setup fee. With that, there's no filtering, but we do block certain things like peer-to-peer uh, -peer traffic, just because it clogs up the pipes pretty bad. We block online gaming and uh, no Vonage phones, just because they take up so much bandwidth that they'll knock other people offline. Even with traffic shaping, they just, either they don't work or they throw off even basic services like web browsing. 
And uh, we also set up a couple of the smaller networks for some of our companies. Okay, and this is the basic layout of our network. It runs from, we have a satellite hop, goes down to our antenna and hits a uh, iDirect 5100 satellite router. Simple switch, small firewall to protect our uh, protocol acceleration proxy server. We'll get more into all these components later. But the main area that our, our guys use goes right here. We've got a Linux firewall running smooth wall that acts as our gateway. Hits a Cisco switch, and we've got FTP, little monitoring node. I make sure nobody's doing anything too crazy on the network. A web server, and then two DSLAMs. From the DSLAMs, we can push out about 2.5 to 3 clicks, a little bit, little bit over a mile to go reach all the different sites. And off those DSLAMs, we have 17 and 18 remote sites, respectively, off each one. Oh, and if any time during this you guys have a question, just feel free to either throw a hand up or shout it out. I mean, it's not a big group, so. This is uh, part of my office. <laughs> One benefit is I really don't have to care what it looks like at all. As long as I know where the wires go, it can look like a cesspool of technology. <laughs> um, we've got it smack dab in the middle of our base, and all the wires come in. It kind of looks like a giant mechanical spider has been living there for a couple years because we have copper lines going everywhere. Okay. Okay. Satellite link. Our uh, upstream provider is a little company based out of the Ukraine called Businesscom. And the guy I work with is a 22 year old, just getting out of college, Ukrainian guy who probably speaks better English than I do. And Really, really fun guys to work with. We've got another guy, Tim Mahoney, in Sweden, and the actual knock for the whole operation is in Travis City, Michigan. We just buy the service off them and then split it up amongst ourselves. Um, only one problem we've ran into since we've been in operation, which has been since September of last year, was that we put more people than they've really ever had on their satellite network, and we broke it. Big problem with how they divvy up bandwidth. We were just getting through that as I came home on leave. Um, yeah. <laughs> the gateway everything runs into is a box running smooth wall corporate edition, just a standard desktop PC, Pentium 4, about two gigs of RAM. And it gives us a lot of good services to work with. The first one being a captivity portal. With a network this large, it spans about three clicks. That's 3,000 meters is a lot more than I can make sure that people aren't running up and just plugging in laptops and sealing service. Because while most of the guys are honest, you always have that one guy who doesn't want to shell out any amount of money to keep this thing running. So we run through the gateway a captivity portal that people log into, and from there it authenticates their machine and lets them go out to the rest of the world. It does our firewall. Um, it's got a layer 7 packet inspection capability where it'll take any uh, BitTurrent, Kaza, LimeWire, anything like that, it, it blocks that traffic. Squid Proxy, which speeds us up a little bit, you know, your standard DHCP and backup DNS. I've only had to reboot it once, and I'm not entirely sure I had to reboot it then. The only time the thing really goes down is whenever we don't have electricity to give to it, because they bring down the generators for maintenance. But even under heavy loads, it stays real stable. It's basically a um, secure socket layer login screen. Okay. Whenever they go to get out on the internet, like say they're going to Yahoo and they haven't signed in, it'll redirect them to the gateway. Oh. Then from there, it just keeps a list of their MAC address and their IP address and will let traffic pass after they log in. Yeah, go ahead, man. You said that uh, the only time it goes down is when you lose generators. You guys don't have any kind of uh, backup system, UPSs or anything like that? Um, no, we have, bat we have uh, UPS systems on the critical parts of the network, but we'll have generators go down to four to six hours because they have to change all the oil out in them. And all of our actual secondary generators are being used for government work, and I haven't been able to steal one yet. We're still working on it. I mean, we've got our eye out, but then we just, we just bring everything down, and guys can deal without being able to get online for about four or five hours. 
I don't want to go s change out things and risk frying a lot of equipment we can't replace. How do you manage the, uh, the logins? Um, when a guy wants to set up an account, he comes into where I work, uh, pays his initial setup fee, and I just create, it's basically a simple Unix login, um, password, and username. Sure. And then I just keep it all manual, uh, keep it just right on a spreadsheet file. No, no, nothing too high speed. I've been trying to keep this, I'm really the only guy who runs it day to day. So I've been trying to keep it as basic as possible. But I looked into that when I was going to start it up. So what's the real difference between smooth ball and smooth ball corporate? Do you get like those added features or something? Um, better documentation. If I had to do it over again, I'd probably just use IPCOP. But this was a, we had a really short timeline to get this off the ground. And I saw that and it looked like it would fit the bill and I was like, okay. <laughs> Let's buy it. And it wasn't too expensive for what you get. It was about 1500 bucks for everything, but it does a lot of features for us. Like it does traffic prioritization, makes it real easy. It's a very clean interface. So I didn't really have to learn too much before I started rolling it out. Hindsight, I'd go with IP Cop the second time because it's free and there are a lot more add-ons you can get with it. Um, Are you concerned uh, with any confidential or secret information going over it? Biggest reason why we block peer-to-peer. -peer. The one thing I'm worried about is a guy not really knowing how a software package like Causa works, sharing out his whole hard drive, and then doing something stupid like planning a mission on his personal laptop, and that getting shared with the internet. That's a big reason why we just dropped that. Aside from that, we have a couple other security things in place that I'll get to in the next couple slides. Does everyone connect through copper? Do you have wireless setup now? We have some wireless access points. Um, it all depends on how close to the perimeter of the base you are. If we have guys on the interior, I keep them pretty much wireless because it's cheaper. And we run 128-bit WEP, which not great protection. I think, what is it now, like 10 minutes to crack WEP, if that. But you know, everybody knows each other. It's a small town. The only thing that if you get closer to the, the edge of the base, I keep those, all those guys wired just for the off chance of somebody setting up a directional antenna and being able to sniff traffic. So a little bit of a mix. I want to hear it. Oh, actually, you'd be amazed. They're starting, to they're starting to kick up. They're starting to actually open up some internet cafes out where we are. And I'm just waiting for one of them with a Pringles can to be like. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> oh, I might need to drop my wireless points then. <laughs> We've got really good. The one thing we excel at is physical security, though. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, you don't do any kind of MAC address filtering authentication? We did that at first, but you reach a limit with the DSLAMs we're using. You can only put 20 guys on a modem. And it's a giant pain in the ass because guys will buy new laptops, their laptop will break, they'll have to come in. We, we were really looking at that. And then also a couple guys realized that it's pretty trivial to spoof a MAC address. And they were getting around it like that. So we moved for th two months. We didn't do a captivity portal. We were running everything off of uh, uh, the physical abilities of the DSLAMs. But then after a couple guys got a little bit wise, then we brought in the captivity portal and that pretty much fixed the problems. I haven't had time to really check to see if you could steal the SSL, like the uh, cookie it puts on your hard drive, and use that. But if, if I find anybody on the base that's that smart, I'm stealing him, and he's going to come work for me. That brings up another question. So has it been more of a problem? You, you said, yeah, you're good with the physical security. But uh, is there like you know, user education that you have to give these guys to like? Hey, don't share out your whole hard drive, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of guys that it was, hey, my mom gave me this laptop. What do I do with it? That whole, we've got a lot of guys who are older, like 40, 42 years old. You know, I'm sorry if anybody's in the Army. That's rather old. Um, but they've just never used it before, and they just want it as a tool to communicate back to the States. And so you've got to basically go, this is a web browser. This is an instant messenger. This is what you don't do. Those little little time where it pops up that says you need updates, yeah, you need to install those. <laughs> and 
They're generally good. It's just a lot of end user. Um, basically, just letting them know the, the lay of the land. Well, a follow-up question would be then, so you got those people, mm -hmm. but are you saying that there's other people in this small, tight community mm -hmm. who are trying to rob you of your services <coughs> anyway? Well, you have, you have the guy who's like, I think that's a little bit too much money. So what we started up with was if two guys wanted to split the costs, that's cool. They just couldn't be online at the same time. And that became, well, let's figure out how we can cheat the system and still pay in half, but be online at the same time. Because there's 24 hours in a day, and if we're only on it for 14 hours each, you know, it's, there was only a handful of guys, so it wasn't too bad. Uh, we're looking at, plus you're looking at out of 350 people, two or three are going to be scumbags, no matter where you go. Um, but, and one of the things we do with user training is I set up a, a small like intranet server that's info.panthernet.fob and just run on a standard desktop PC and using actually, if anybody's heard of Clark Connect Linux, uh, really, uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's an underground distro, but it's not too popular. What it lets you do, though, is it's probably the simplest way I've ever seen to set up a LAMP server. It pretty much does all the muscle work for you. You put it in, you select, hey, I want this, this, and the other thing, and it'll set up everything, including SSL logins for you. Really nice if you ever need something like that. So we did a LAMP setup with using Mambo as the uh, CMS. And same exact hardware as the gateway, but through two pretty large hard drives in there. And since we don't let the guys go out and do peer-to-peer, -peer, we just kind of cached everything. Like, everybody, anybody here with, like, any of the copyright people? Anybody here, like, <laughs> working for the record industry? Or move? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so we basically just ripped everybody's stash that they brought with them, put them on one site, and then when people want to go download stuff, they pull it off the web server, and they don't clog up the pipes. And by pull th porn, that's basically the only thing gets put up there. <laughs> like porn, like two Britney Spears albums, it's pretty bad. <laughs> OK, but we use it also for uh, billing. And anytime I have an announcement, like, hey, generator's going down, your bills are due, we're doing this to the network. So you know, just post announcements. I usually. I should have brought them so you guys could read them because sometimes it's three in the morning and I get pretty irate. And I had some funny quotes. Just, and the great thing about it is you can call out people by name. They're like, yeah, I know what you're doing and you've got a virus and you haven't disconnected and you're knocking your entire platoon offline. I'll let them handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, a couple other things it does for us is I set it up as a backup uh, DNS caching server just to take some load off the gateway. I'm running Snort on it just because I can. Um, nothing really useful because we're behind a NAT and it doesn't really tell me what NAT address it is. It's just like, okay, the same IP address that everybody in the world uses is having problems. Great. Thanks. Um, and it's our network time protocol server. Um, here's one of the screenshots for our intranet site. Do you want to read? Let's see if I put anything. Uh, oh, yeah. March 19th. Here's a good one. I'm sick of saying it. Stop assigning static IP addresses to your machines in the .1.xxx range. We have important devices living there. <laughs> Guys will just put static addresses in, and they like to pick 1.1, which is our gateway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's got all our little, like, if they can't get to the log on for some reason, they can go down. Let me see if my mouse is working. There we go. Yeah, we got log on. We got a secondary FTP server set up. And here is payments and money tracker, so that way they don't think I'm robbing them blind. So they can see, hey, here's what we have coming in, here's what we have going out. Uh, general rules, yeah, standard internet site for something like this. If there is something like this, I'm not really quite sure. Um, here's an example. You can tell I didn't do too much work when it comes to how we index files. It's just standard Apache. Here you go. And when they want to go pay their bills, they just Go straight to PayPal. Okay, uh, pet proxy. Ran into a pretty interesting problem where we have a lot of military sites that want you to have a US IP address to get into them. And these aren't like, you know, secret cloak and dagger websites. They're more just army sites where you go to do your online courses. Oh, go ahead, man. Um, you said you're, it's an internet site. You're mm -hmm. 
domain, or did you just put that into your DNS server that way? Whenever they punch that in. Good question. Yeah, it's just right with our DNS caching. It just before they go out and talk to the ISPs, DNS, they talk to ours. So, kind of like a so yeah, <laughs> it, it's yeah, it's basically just uh, the little DNS server running on the gateway redirects them to that IP address. Anything else? What well, we got a pause going? Go for it. The TLD you're using is FOP forward operating base. Yeah, the FOP because that's not out in the internet. Um, oh yeah, if anybody's wondering, a FOB is a forward operating base. It's basically just a base camp. That's the new in vogue term for it. But our actual IP is out of Sweden, which is really funny when the first time some guy goes to Google and is wondering why it's in whatever language Sweden speaks. <laughs> um, so they, they speak Swedish in Sweden? Okay, I thought it was Spanish. I don't know. I, I didn't get by in uh, geography. <laughs> um, but so um, they gave us BusinessCom runs Unix-based solution that's uh, called a PEP protocol acceleration proxy. That is really great when you have less than 100 people. After 100 people, it cro it just crashes out. Watchdog has to keep restarting it. So set this up as a backup that if a guy needs to go to, like the one of the one of the sites we were having problems with was the. Sergeant Majors Academy. So I had both Sergeant Majors who severely outrank me breathing down my neck to get them on so they could do their coursework. <laughs> um, this way we funnel them through here. It looks like we're coming from a US IP address. And then we can get around that whole, you're in a foreign country block. Because right now I can't find anybody. Anybody here work for a Department of Defense? Anybody? No? If anybody does, please come see me so I can figure out how to register my IP with Nippernet, so they know we're not from Sweden. <laughs> um, but basically, this thing's just running on Fedora Core 3 on a really, really old compact that we found sitting in the corner of a building when we took over the base. Um, good, pro good, really good system. Strips out a lot of the overhead that you have in TCP IP, turns everything to a UDP stream. Really good until you hit about 100 guys, then it crashes on you. <clears throat> Okay, the other thing we put in for added storage space is one of those little uh, Buffalo Terra stations. Close to a terabyte of storage space. I just let guys upload, download whatever they want from there. I usually don't even watch that box too much, aside from to, you know, put security patches on it. Okay, and here's the main section of the uh, whole operation. Walk over here since I got this wireless mic, which I'm really starting to like. Um, Okay, we got one Cisco switch. Ties pretty much every different node we have goes through that switch. And if I ever need to monitor, because I think a virus is loose or something shady is going on, you can set it to do a span port. So even though it's a switch, it'll broadcast everything to that, to one port on the switch, so you can sniff just like it was a hub. The last unit said that that was a personally owned switch, but it looks exactly like the ones the military uses. So I don't know if we own that or not, but a lot of things to get this run and a lot of things fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> um, and we've got two uh, Paradigm Bitstorm 4100 D-slams that just push DSL, uh, DSL lines across the base. We can get out to about, mm, I think we could get out to 3,000 meters, but we've never really needed to go that far, so we haven't tried it. Um, pretty simple. They cost about thirteen hundred each, and for what they let you do, it's it's a reasonable price. They're all web managed. I've knocked down the rates. They can do four megabits by one megabit pretty reliably, but I knocked down the speed just because we get less errors. Because if you, you'll see in a second, we don't use standard Cat three cable for it because we don't have any. We've kind of jerry rigged something that works, and the most important part of this tower is the baby Jesus. We were having serious problems. We took the baby Jesus nativity scene, put that right up on top. <laughs> Problem solved. So what you're saying is that it's Jesus net now? Or? Jesus saves, that's all I can say. <laughs> not even too religious, but it's working, so I'm not going to knock it. Jesus saves, no need for backups? <laughs> 
Yeah, just, well, kind of. We use Zoom for the endpoints. Little Zoom modems cost about 60 bucks a pop. But Paradigm, those two are what we use for our cheapest price. It seems to be working, so. OK, and here's how we got it all punched down. It goes into two punch down blocks. But rather than using the standard Cat3 that you normally use, we are using WD1 and WF16 field phone wire, which is this real gritty, hard military issue stuff that, again, falls off the back of a truck. <laughs> we just kind of, when we see a spool, we hide it and ask for more spools. <laughs> it works. It is a little bit tougher than Cat3. And we just let it run right across the base. Some, I make the guys run their own lines. Like if, say, first platoon wants a line, that's great. I'll set everything up. But they have to maintain the wire that runs from their building to the office. Because I just don't have time to be tracing lines. So some of them will do it the smart way, bury it, protect it, and they're good to go. Other people kind of just like, uh, lay it right out in the middle of the earth. And then a tank will come by and s snap it. And they'll have to go out, walk the wire, re-splice it. Then they'll be like, that's great. Two days will go by. The same tank will go by. Cut the line again in the same spot. <laughs> then they run out and splice it. And they do that five, six times before they realize it's time to get a shovel and bury the damn thing. But you know, a little bit tough on the punch down blocks. But once you get the hang of how to wedge them in there, it works. And at the endpoints, we have Zoom X6 modems operating as a simple bridge. I don't have them routing doing anything like that. They just complete the connection. Um, pretty much all Ethernet once it leaves the gateway. A little bit of problems of doing it that way, but it got us off the ground to begin with, and I don't feel like going back and changing it now. Um, the X6 modems are pretty good just because not only will they do the modem part for you, but they operate as a wireless access point, and the WAP operate as a four-port switch, too, which is handy. Um, one big problem we've had with Wi-Fi is the FCC does not go to Iraq. So the 2.4 gigahertz range, all bets are off. Um, there are certain things out there that jam it. The Air Force likes to run things. You know, it's basically a, the whole ionosphere is kind of a soup out there. So if you're in the wrong part of the base, your wireless isn't going to work. You'll get like 10 feet range. <laughs> and then the buildings were all British and made in like the 30s and 40s. So it's concrete this thick. So to wire one building, you'll have to put maybe one or two access points in, depending on how the layout is. And the other biggest problem we run into is everything we buy wants to use 110 power, but all the wiring is done European style, and it's all 220 volt. <laughs> so you'll have guys that just plug it right into a 220, and it explodes. <laughs> and they're like, oh, why doesn't it work? Then they'll let you come in and troubleshoot it, and they'll take about 15, 20 minutes to go, I saw smoke coming out of it earlier. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> um, that's about it. And we don't have enough. Uh, for some reason, it's really hard to get battery backups like UPS systems shipped to us. No commercial site wants to do it. I guess it's because it's lead-based and heavy. So they just won't ship it to us. So we buy the cheapest equipment we can find, and whenever it gets blown up, we just replace it. Okay. Like we go, well, I'd, I'd say we've, out of about 30 switches operating on the network, anywhere between 30 and 40, they last about five or six months and they start to burn out just because the power is so unclean. Okay, billing. Billing's really fun. This is the part that I tried to push off to our S1 administration shop and they told me to, in no uncertain terms, go to hell. So I'm doing billing as well as doing all the tech crap for this. I'm still a little bit bitter about it. But we have no banks. We do everything through PayPal. PayPal gets about 2.5% off the top. I mean, it's kind of worth it, though, because I got an electronic log of every transaction. I don't want to get too mired down into the billing side of this, though, because it's a pain in the ass. Only thing that keeps me up at night, though, because so far this project's been, when we conclude, it'll be a quarter million dollar project. And I'm waiting to get audited. <laughs> Uh, but basically, it's completely non-for-profit. Even I pay in my monthly, my monthly uh, stipend to the uh, cause. Because at the end of it, I don't want any customers. Because if I have customers, then they have like certain rights and privileges. 
but right now, since it's kind of like a hippie commune, I can tell anybody I want to go to hell. I mean, it's really awesome. It's like, it uh, don't matter to me. I mean, your computer sucks. It's not my fault. Everybody else is having problems. So there's no, uh, you can basically focus on strictly technical solutions rather than worry about it being a business. And plus, it'd be pretty scumbag to be profiting off guys who are about 4,000 miles from home. OK, what else we got? This is basically how the uh, login screen works. Whenever you try to go out on your web browser to get to Yahoo or wherever you're going, it hits you with that red sign. You sign in, and boom, you're logged in. Uh, blocks all traffic. I am everything until you do this, and it refreshes automatically every hour. OK, network monitoring. Uh, I'll actually take a brief pause here. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? Things we covered? You have a lot of problems with dust and how do you deal with it? Dust, yes, and we don't. Um, cans of air. I, there's no way there's no way to keep the dust from getting in. It's this real fine silt that you just every couple every couple months, like every actually every couple weeks you just go in there with canned air and blow them out and hope for the best. Have we lost anything we, you did that? What's that? No, surprisingly, we've not lost anything to dust, which right now as I say that, there are about two boxes that are just dying right now because of dust. I'm going to bet money. Right now, they just went offline. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What about heat since you're in the desert during the day? Oh, the heat? Heat's a problem. I mean, the heat out there gets out to about 120, but where we keep all the equipment is air conditioned. So we just put the boxes near the air conditioner and hope for the best. A lot of this is kind of rolling the dice. Um, now, when it comes to heat, it's not actually as bad as it sounds, just because as long as the sun's not beating directly down on it, it doesn't get hot really in like the back rooms in, for only about three or four hours, plus with the AC, they generally stay up and running. Um, just in terms of policy and, and dealing with the DOD, is, is there any, any issues that you've run into or kind of what's the relationship? I mean, obviously, this isn't connected to DOD networks or anything. It's totally isolated. It's an island. But nevertheless, just from like a policy standpoint, do you have any issues now or projected with DOD in regard to, hey, you're rolling your own network here, and you know, we, we can't control it and audit it? I mean, are there any issues like that? It's kind of a, it's a touchy subject, to be honest, because at any time, it's not like the DOD is a separate entity from me. I work for them. So if they wanted to roll in and say, we're going to shut this down, I would be like, OK, and disconnect it. But they're never going to do that, because everybody who's in the DOD is also over there, and they like to check their email. So it's kind of a, we maintain complete network Nazi ownership over it. So if anything were to become a problem, we'd sit down. I have unit reps. We'd all get together and hammer out how we're going to deal with it. But I don't think they'd ever just straight come in and shut us down because it's too good for morale. Now, if we see people doing things on the network that could compromise their security, yeah, we're going to turn that off, not because the DOD might come down on us, just as a personal safety thing. You know, if uh, mission times are getting leaked over the internet, we're turning it off. Because as much as I like going online, I want to keep my legs. <laughs> so. Not to get too serious about it, but yeah, we, we have vested interest in making sure the policies that are put in place that make sense get enforced. So I don't think we'll ever get into a problem, really. Has it been an issue? No, not actually, no. Um, everybody's preschooled up on OPSEC, and they know what to talk about and what not to talk about. If we have a casualty, we were going into uh, just shutting down the network to make sure that didn't get leaked out. But all of our guys are actually pretty smart when it comes to that. No, no. In fact, I make sure it's only military personnel. I'm actually really sketchy even when it comes to US contractors. And no foreign nationals get on the network. That's one way I keep in. The biggest reason is because if it's one of our guys, I have sway over him where I can be like, hey, this guy's doing this. If he works for a civilian company, I can't do anything to him. So I keep it just strictly military on the network. This is a lot more fun than me talking. I like when you guys ask questions, because I, I have no idea how long this talk will run. Uh, monitoring. Monitoring is pretty simple. Just to see how uh, traffic's flown across the network, I use IFTOP. 
I do uh, open sheesh from the uh, Power Mac right into that, and it lets you know. Um, other forms of monitoring, Smoothwall gives you pretty good readouts. Like if you see right here, you can see where our generator went down, um, the little gaps. But generally speaking, runs pretty solid. Um, to do even more monitoring, I found one laptop that wasn't being used for anything, and I set it up as a Ubuntu box and put that up on the port on the switch where I can do a span port into it. And we'll do, every, so, every now and then I'll sniff uh, Etherreal just to see if there's anything crazy on the network, like I've been noticing a lot of IPX packets floating around and uh, universal plug and play packets which have no business being there, so you track those down, shut them off. Um, I also run Nexus. Has anybody played with uh, Nexus 3 yet? Anybody use Nexus, period? Okay, if you guys get a chance, use 3, because I've noticed it's about four or five times faster. It'll chew through, like, my biggest problem with using the older versions was it would take so long to do a scan. This is a heck of a lot faster on our network. And then if I have a security problem, like a known vul vulnerability pops up, I just email that report to the user whose machine's affected, and they usually fix it. Um, same thing with Nmap. Nmap and, uh, like, P0F, a couple of the operating system uh, detection things, is that there's one really easy way to get around our entire logon system, and that's just to put a router in place, authenticate that IP address that the router has, and then any, any number of your friends can hide behind that router and get online. So I just look for routers every couple of days. So far that hasn't been a problem though. Nobody's popped up uh, since the second month we were online. And into security. We kind of touched on this already, but I'll, I'll go over some of the things we do to make sure sensitive information isn't leaking out. Um, no unsolicited traffic. Nothing comes in past that gateway that isn't asked for. Um, stateful packet firewall. If you want to host a web server, you can't. If you want to host anything to the outside world, we just drop everything as it hits a gateway. Um, we also only allow in ports that we know. Like we let deny all, and then we'll do okay, AIM's allowed in, uh, web traffic, of course, is allowed in, and we go down from there. So anything that's not being used for a known service that our guys need, we just block all traffic in and out. Um, all clients have to have updated antivirus, anti-spyware, and automatic updates turned on. Also, if you have a machine that's below Windows 2000, it's not allowed on the network. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer is blocked, which we touched on earlier, and I'm also blocking IRC right now except for like one guy who I port forward to because he has an IRC network he wants to play with back home. I didn't ask any more questions besides that. <laughs> but, uh, um, quick uh, question. Uh, you say nothing below Windows 2000. You're, uh, you're excluding Windows ME as well, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's got to be Windows. It has to be NT-based or, or Mac OS, any version, or Linux. Okay. Well, uh, Would, more than you think. I think we're about at 5% right now. I've got a handful of people. I run that in Mac OS X. I, not because I'm like snobbish about it. I just really don't like Windows. Um, I just, there, I, I like having a bash sale, so I just don't use it. And then I've turned a couple guys onto it just because they just wanted to check their email and go on Instant Messenger. And if they don't know anything about computers, I'd rather put them on Ubuntu where they don't have to spend as much time securing it as they do Windows. We're getting close to end. Okay, um, mixed. It runs the entire gamut. We have guys who are technical professionals that came out of the woodwork around eight months into our deployment because they didn't want to get sucked into working on anything. And we have guys who, hey, this is my first computer. What do I do with it? Um, we also block IP ranges from countries that I don't like. It's a personal thing. If I don't like your country, we don't talk to you. <laughs> China's blocked. Syria's blocked. Iran's blocked. France, I, I'm thinking about it. I'm really thinking about it. So, it, okay, I'll make a note. Actually, we'll just block France. Okay, I don't think we have any French speakers. I almost blocked all of Africa, but I found out a, one of our kids has uh, family there, so I had to unblock Liberia. 
<laughs> okay, um, problems we ran into. Incredibly fast growth. I was expecting to support about 150 people. We're up to about 350 right now. Um, other problems? Anybody here a physics major? Because I'm pretty sure rockets emit an electromagnetic pulse. Because <laughs> we took two rounds real close to where our knock was, and it completely scrambled the firmware on both our D-slams. Just crump, crump, and oh shit, the network's down. <laughs> um, quick refresh, got it back up, but that's just one of the things. We'll have uh, incoming rounds that cut the wires a lot. That's a pain in the ass because you won't even see it. It'll just be a little piece of shrapnel in one of your wires, and it shorts everything out. Uh, no infrastructure, we already talked about. My mom, wife, sister, religious leader, or life partner bought me this laptop, desktop, calculator, toaster, and I have never worked one before. Oh yeah, a lot of guys don't know what a computer is. Um, oh, a lot of people will like to unplug things. I had one guy take a switch out of his room, bundle up all the cables real nice and neat, set it outside his room, and then he wondered why nobody could get online. Yeah, uh, we have a huge address range. That's one thing. If I hand this over to a, another group of guys coming through, I'd do it more like an actual ISP, where each unit would be more like a house that subscribes and gets an addressable IP address and let them deal with inner house issues. But right now, we've got like a 65,000 IP address range. And it's just really hard to manage. Do you have problems with um, Not as many as I thought we were going to have. I thought we were going to have a lot more than we do. But generally speaking, there's not too much inner base communication. They're all just trying to get out online. And so it's not flooding the lines. If that starts happening, I'll have to reorganize how we do the routers. A little bit, but the problem is there's not much to look at. Um, they're just getting it off the ground. Um, we're talking going in and completely rebuilding it. And we have the problem of they want to run like a fiber optic line. Where do they always run fiber optic lines? Along the roads. What happens along the roads? People put 500 pound bombs there and blow it up. So I hear Baghdad's actually pretty good when it comes to actual infrastructure. But out where we're at, near Ramadi, Fallujah, that area, it's still kind of they're getting on the ground. They're getting, uh, right before I left, guys noticed that their cell phones started working. So that's good. They got cell phone communication out there. Um, but yeah, if I had to do it all over again, I'd operate this whole thing more like an ISP rather than a local area network. But OK, back onto your question of infrastructure. Mm, computer networks over there, from what I understand, I'm not really an authority on this one, it was basically military only. There was an embargo on anything above a Pentium computer because a Pentium class PC is also a kind of a weapon system if you use it the right way. You can use anything above 133 megahertz to guide a cruise missile. <laughs> so there wasn't many computers whenever we got there. They're actually a lot better off when it comes to links to the outside wor world than they were before we got there but it's still not that great if you don't live in a major metropolitan area. It's kind of like being in the country in the United States whenever uh, we first started doing the internet thing. I'd say give them another year or two. I'm already starting to see satellite-based internet cafes pop up, which is a good sign. Um, they're more interested in getting uh, TV than anything else. <laughs> oh, OK. We get, I, how, how much time do I got left? Five minutes, okay, let me run through this real quick and hopefully we can get a question or more to in. The payoff, why you'd go through so much hassle to do all this crap, because it is a lot of work. One, Amazon, they ship SpaghettiOs. They will ship you groceries to an APO. The food's really bad. I've got about 30 cans of SpaghettiOs waiting for me when I get back. I'm happy, I don't go to the chow hall ever again. Um, you're not stuck in an information black hole. One of the biggest problems is you don't get most news sources, it's not like there's a daily paper. So here we can go out, we can read the news. Um, it's some form of entertainment. You can take care of stuff back home. You can do your online courses. And uh, you're not just separated. You know, It doesn't feel like you're too far away from home. And you can still talk to all your friends. You can still know what's going on. Like before I was out on this, I was with the uh, 
Marines and we did two six month floats overseas and you completely miss it. You completely miss like what movies are playing and what, what people are talking about. You're just off in your own little world. With this system, eh, at least we know what everybody else is doing. And questions? Come on, I got like two minutes. Everything all at once. That, that's what it was. It was not having enough time to actually sit down and plan everything. It was more like, hey, we want this, we need this now. Roll it out to a large number of people simultaneously up front. Yeah, it was like, hey, we need to get this done, and why is it going to take more than a week to do it? <laughs> and they have a tendency to think that this is the same thing as Comcast, where there's an infrastructure and people aren't shooting at you, and it's actually a nice place to live and work. They just were like, well, Comcast only charges 40 bucks. Why does it cost us? <laughs> it's like, I, I'm not even going to read. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, let's see if they offer service out here. Go to their little website and punch in your area code. Oh, you don't have a phone. Maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> in the back? Yeah, and I'm actually a little bit pissed off at Skype. Because when we first got there, it worked great. Um, they had about 2.5 million people logged on because we have to go through Skype in Europe rather than Skype in the United States. They had about 2.5 million people using it, and it worked beautifully. It didn't take up too much bandwidth. You could get nice calls back home. It was cheap. It was great. More people catch on, and now it's up to like 5 million users at any given time. And so I got all these guys coming to me wanting to know why Skype doesn't work. And it's like, guys, I, I don't run Skype. It's their problem. They're like, but it worked a month ago. I'm like, yeah, it's not me. <laughs> Skype needs to expand their servers. But yeah, we, the only thing we block is the hard, the hard phone, like Vonage phones, because they'll take about 80 kilobits. On, and 80 kilobits for one call is OK. 80, 80 kilobits divided up against 10 guys on their phones, and it crashes the whole system. We do uh, traffic prioritization, but still doesn't fix everything. Yeah, but AT&T already offers that on the base. Um, they actually already have a system like that set up, so there hasn't been a huge demand for it. Okay. What do you use to prioritize the traffic? Uh, Smoothwall actually takes care of all of it. Um, just a basic quality of service script that you can go in and set up. You, I set it up to split high, low, and slow traffic. High would be our web traffic, stuff like that. Low would be our um, webcams, voice over IP and instant messenger traffic, and then slow is anything that like shouldn't really even be going on anyway. But I just block everything out as slow, that I don't know where else to put it. Um, you said you were running Smoothwall. Are you running uh, 3.0? Or are you still Actually, it's Smoothwall Corporate 4. I haven't really checked in. Um, if I was going to go with a completely free solution, which I would do if I had to do it all over again, I'd just run the latest version of IPCOP. Because the add-on packages that are just freaking awesome. So besides UPS, what else is on your wish list that if it fell off the truck tomorrow? Oh, what I'd want? Yeah. A uh, PepLink load balancer and two more small Soho satellite dishes. What I'd love to get is two more dishes, have two cheap, like $1,500 a month ones so I could offer services like online gaming, going out one dish like dedicated voice over IP off another dish, and then the big dish serving everything else. Um, then run into the pep box and into the rest of the network. That's what I'd love to have. What type of latency do you see on the satellite uplink, and how does it affect you? About 650 megabits per second. And that's the biggest reason why I don't let online gaming, because I don't want to deal with their tech issues, and that and bandwidth. Um, but it, whenever I get them, it just says, hey, you have an update. And I go, OK, we'll install it. And I install it, and I wait until the generator to go out to reboot it on its own. Um, and I, I haven't run into a problem. I think that's one of the things that they, uh, they kind of do for you if you pay them money, which is why I don't think I'd go back to them again, because I think they're, they're actual free open source product. They're cutting the legs out from under it 
just so they sell more copies of the corporate version. I'm done? Okay. Well, see you guys. Well, these guys are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. Before I start talking.